Uh, this book is called Collateral Trout, and half the stories in here are true and half are fiction. And so I'll, uh, this is a true story called Code of the West. Code of the West. That was our group's catchphrase for everything. It had developed on a certain trip into Montana's Beartooths in the summer of 1988, the summer of the big Yellowstone fires. The quip had multiple layers of meaning for us. A four pack of anglers from New England. The phrase had nearly universal application. It might be used for an answer for anything as why it was your turn to bear bag, why it was this way and not that way, or why something unpleasant needed to be undertaken. It carried a whiff of the macho with, with it, a subtext of John Wayne saying, suck it up, pilgrim. The phrase could be used as an answer to everything that needed explaining. To this day, I regret that explanation for not reporting a grim and puzzling discovery. Some of the fires were already ongoing when we hiked deep into the Beartooth wilderness planning a 10-day foray in quest of golden trout. Fishing for these elusive fish in the Flood Creek Basin, we had enjoyed a miraculous day, looking like a scene from the apocalyptic Bi an apocalyptic Bible movie. The sky had darkened from the ongoing fires just south of us in the park. However, any disconcert we had from this or from the fact that ash was dropping from the sky on our heads was totally eclipsed by some of the best fishing of a lifetime. In an amazing 10 or 12 hours of daytime twilight, the trout went nuts taking everything we threw at them. The following day, we were on our way for a long climb to Lightning Lake, reputed to be one of Montana's premier lakes for Goldens. We also knew that this high of elevation lake would give us access to a great view of what was going on with the wildfire. These plans were soon shortcut by our encounter with a Forest Service officer who ordered us out of the wilderness and back to the trailhead. In an ironic turn of geography, we headed into Yellowstone Park, as large parts of the park were still open had not been evacuated. Staying in one of the open campgrounds, we made plans to fish the Yellowstone River. We followed the Black Tail Deer Creek Trail, that's east of Mammoth Hot Springs, about three miles downstream and a thousand feet downhill to the Yellowstone River. Our thoughts were that the hike in the 2,000 feet of up and down would cut out the angling crowd, which in Yellow Yellowstone is legion in number. Once on the river, we crossed it on a suspension bridge and hiked upstream more than a mile before we set in to fish. We figured that we would find a stretch of river that was not heavily pounded by other anglers. There was no real wading in the big water that characterizes this reach, but its edges had fish aplenty for us, and the speed and roughness of the water was enough to camouflage my sloppy casts. Using stimulators, wolves, and other large flies, we took plenty of cutthroats in the 15-inch range and some larger. After five hours of fishing, we were ready to head home and assembled for the trek back to the suspension bridge and the thousand foot climb up to the trailhead. As we side hilled it a hundred feet or so uh, above the right bank of the river, a shining glint caught the eye of one of our party. Check this out. We gathered around a small object he held in his hand. It was a human tooth along with a tiny piece of jawbone. Now, none of us were specialists in distinguishing dental differences in man versus beast, but this was a pretty easy call. The tooth had dental fillings in it, and there is no animal that we know that goes to a dentist. The tooth was weathered and not a recent addition to the landscape. What do we do? We huddled and debated the course of action. Should we bring it to the authorities? We planned one more day of fishing before we uh, headed back to Bozeman. And this little discovery could screw that up with questions and maybe even a return trip to the river and not for fishing. After some animated debate, our trout posse decided we were going to leave it just where we found it 
for another park visitor to find. Why? Code of the West. <laughs> Just a true story. And uh, I have huge regrets that we didn't follow up on it. Now, I mean, there's, there's some big mystery out there. And uh, I don't know what it is, but uh, sort of kicking myself in the butt for, uh, for going, going along. I don't know if anybody else has regrets, but it probably would have been an extra day of uh, fooling around with the authorities and so on. As it is, I don't know. You know, I don't know what has ever happened, if that thing is still there, if somebody would find it or, or whatever. Uh, gee, I only milked that for five minutes. Bob, come and save me. I'm going to give you one more story here. Let's see. I'm hoping I'm not going to repeat. So I have, uh, have, have any of you been to any of my book uh, presentations? Oh, good. Oh, you have. All right. Well, I might, maybe I hit something you've already are familiar with. Uh, all right. This is, we'll go local with this one. This was a trip uh, it's up near Wheeler Pond in the Northeast Kingdom. This is called Ducking a Duck. The trip started out quite routine, routine like the last meal served to a condemned prisoner. Since we had a late summer backpacking trip to Idaho's Big Bighorn Crags planned, four of us took it to mind to do a bit of a shakedown cruise. Our destination was among a cluster of backwoods ponds in the town of Sutton, Vermont. None of this had been made a previous visit. Would stuff those uh, backpacks, those 4,500 cubic inch packs as if we were going for 10 days and then take a roundabout hike into the pond for an overnight fish in. The theory was to build up a little endurance for the Idaho trip. As to where we would put our rods to use and our heads to the pillow, we decided on Duck Pond. To make for a longer hike, we would start from Big Wheeler Pond, about two miles north of Duck, and take the serpentine trail that was indicated on our maps. This would give us about an eight mile round trip over the 24 hour period. We arrived at Big Wheeler around noon. It was late July, sweltering hot and humid. In addition to what we would actually need, each of our packs was filled with enough ballast to weigh 60 to 70 pounds, depending on who was carrying it. I was a little guy, I would get the 60 pound packs. Uh, they felt murderously heavy as we shouldered them, locked the cars and headed in. The rough trail snaked through a lush green forest with much open floor. The high emerald canopy was beautiful and provided just enough shade to spare us heat stroke. This being the first power hike of the season for all of us, nobody was singing trail songs as we zigzagged our way to duck in the heat of, in the heat of a breezeless summer afternoon. It felt like we had done about 10 miles when we dropped our packs at Blake Pond. Like French legionnaires in a B movie, we immediately stripped and plunged screaming into the pond the cool water, a hefty snack, and about an hour's passage were enough to revive us for the last quarter mile to Duck Pond. We put our burdens down in a large clearing at the south end of Duck Pond. Our horizon was a nice view of the leeward side of Mount Hoare on the horizon at the far end of the pond. Beautiful. We made camp and cooked a hasty supper on the MSR stoves. We were four whooped puppies. It was pretty close to six o'clock when I strung up my rod and began fishing. With nearly three hours of fishing left, and even with the encouragement of a 10-inch brookie that I soon caught and released, I knew that I was not gonna make the magic fishing hour. Early crash and up with the birds, now that sounded like a plan. I was not at all alone in these ruminations. Indeed, I was the only one who had bothered to put a rod together. It was not yet seven o'clock when open talk began about hitting the sack. In minutes, we were getting things in order to head for the bags. We were about to wipe the bevy as sedentary 40-somethings as you could imagine. Oh, to be a 40-something again. Suddenly we heard what sounded like a lawnmower bawling in the distance. The sound grew louder and then in an instant, a beat up VW Beetle sped into camp with a hundred feet or more of clearing to select from, it parked abruptly 15 feet from one of our pitched tents. 
it immediately disgorged two campers, Leroy and Roy. Excuse me, Leon and Roy. Yes, they had prominent tattoos of skulls, blood dripping daggers, and an old girlfriend's name that had resisted eradication, but they were congenial enough. They immediately came up to introduce themselves and check us out. They assumed, uh, they assured us they personally had fished out the pond last May, warned us about the bears, and offered detailed directions on how we might drive our cars in the next time we came. They then proceeded to break into one of two cases of beer they had brought along, offering us a six-pack with genuine hospitality. We declined politely. Our thoughts about immediately bedding down had evaporated. Even if we could have overcome the embarrassment of going to bed at 7 o'clock at night on a sunny July evening, the incessant banner and arguing in which the two were constantly engaged would have made sleep impossible. They argued about everything how to pitch the tarp, where to build a fire, who owed who money for beer and gas, and where was the best place to lay a bullet into a charging bear, and so on. When all was said and done, they pitched their, their tarp, tarp right off the VW, extending their territorial claim within eight feet of our tents. We found this especially remarkable because the clearing was very large and offered several alternative sites. Though all of this was characterized by a completely affable demeanor, it was more disconcerting than flattering. Moments before, we were blissfully tired, ready for bed and being serenaded by a chorus of thrush in a spectacular natural setting. The transformation was as profound and as instantaneous as switching channels on TV. Well, that's enough of PBS's nature. Let's watch Channel 11, Freddy Krueger and his minions go camping. Then, the sure reality absolutely blossomed as they began to build their fire. They made a beeline for an abandoned culvert and proceeded to break off two and three inch thick slabs of obs this obsidian-like tar coating. In a very short time, they had amassed 50 pounds of this stuff. They threw about 40 pounds of it into a hastily scraped fire ring, added a couple of pieces of wood as a garnish, and set the black mass ablaze. The resulting fire was an eerie replica of the oil field fires of the Gulf War. The thick black smoke <clears throat> billowed skyward as they broke out a gaggle of chicken parts and laid them on a grill they had taken along for the task. Leon, the barbecue master, barked directions at Roy as to how to position the grill precisely so that the chicken lay in the exact plane where the Halloween orange flames gave birth to the dense, inky fumes of the tar smoke. The four of us exchanged furtive glances and bit our lips bloody. The generosity of these two tattooed waves cannot be hardly overstated. No sooner was the chicken warm than it was pulled from the fire. The dish looked very similar to Louisiana blackened cuisine, except these had an attractive rainbow shimmer when they caught the light just right. Select pieces of these semi-raw ebony carcasses were offered to us. We declined and by now were appearing to be rather abstemious old farts to this devil-may-care duo. As Leon and Roy worked through the chicken and beer, the adrenaline that their advent had stirred in us began to wear off. As the twelfth empty can of beer joined the others in the flaming tar pit, I was again realizing just how bushed I was. Glancing at the remaining 36 full cans, now amassed in Napoleonic formation at the water's edge, and seeing a pile of extra batteries for the boombox radio that now emerged from the limitless bowels of the VW, I began to think that things could hardly be worse. Quite simply, I was dead wrong. More visitors. With little to herald their coming, two pickup trucks pulled into the clearing. They were filled with laughing, drinking, shrieking, frisbee-throwing, bandana-dog-owning bandana students from Linden State College, or so we had guessed. The new crowd was co-ed, a number of a dozen or so. Everybody waved at everybody. Of course, because Leon and Roy camped right on top of us, the new arrivals certainly thought we were all together and that Leon was our leader 
because he never get let up on barking orders telling Roy what, to, Roy what to do. The newly arrived troop branched out with the coordination of a South American army ants and very quickly denuded the entire compound of any do downed wood. Then out came the axes, hand saws, and even a chainsaw as they continued to amass fuel for what's going to be the mother of all bomb fires. As soon as Leon and Roy saw the chainsaw, they became socially ignited. They struck up a conversation with the students and complimented them on their preparedness. Of course, Leo, Leon and Roy usually bring a chainsaw when they go camping, but they were coming here and they knew there would be plenty of culvert tar and they wouldn't need much wood. The students returned to the prepared, they, they, students returned the preparedness compliments by referencing the three dozen beers that were now at the ready in the shallow water and expressing their own concern that they might not have, they might have to send out one of the trucks to the store. We were in a state of mental collapse. As we pondered our respective uh, mind, as we pondered our respective mind movies of what the in evening would hold for us. Was that a conga drum in the back of the truck? Time passed. The college crowd eventually figured out that Leon and Roy were not out with us on a father's and son's fishing trip. Once they had done that, the social fabric of the encampment quickly developed into us and them. Leon and Roy abandoned the smoldering tar pit and took up their seats at the bonfire near some of the co-eds, hoping against hope that somehow the gods of love would favor them with a miracle. <laughs> this darkness began to gather and the bonfires spewed sparks 20 feet into the air. Their talk turned again to bear. Then the guns came out. The college crowd bragged a 22 carbine, a 410 single shot, and a small 22 revolver. Leon had a 12 gauge uh, a 12-gauge 12, 12 shotgun with a pistol grip and vented barrel. Roy had an army surplus 45. They were passing these freely around, slapping each other on the back and brandishing them toward the far edge of the clearing. We were at our physical limits and the coming in night was all we needed. We gave them a good night and headed for the bags. We knew that there was going to be a few hours of rowdy drinking, but we felt bushed enough to hope for sleep, noise or no noise. Again, dead wrong. Apparently, we, we had been the parental authority figures in this encampment. So as soon as we were tucked in and out of sight, the festivities intensified to bacchanalian proportions. Over the next hour or so, to a musical score of ear-splitting heavy metal rock, the scene escalated from shotgunning beers to shotgunning shotguns. If there was ever a bevy of accidents waiting to happen, this assemblage was it. Here they were, shithouse drunk, passing around loaded guns, swilling additional mass quantities of beer and shooting off rounds towards the other, other end of the lake. Were there any bears sneaking up on the bonfire from that end of the lake, they were put on no, notice by a hail of gunfire that Leon and company were putting out in that direction. At each report of a 22, our stomachs cramped with fear. When either the 410 or the 12 gauge went off, we would thrash into the air an inch or two off our sleeping pads, like cardiac patients being jolted with electric paddles. We were literally getting hit in our faces with each blast. Our geodesic tome, dome, uh, dome tents were tautly uh, pitched, and their coated ripstop nylon skins produced tympanic action to the actual air blast into our face in concert with each fired round. The occurrence of shots were completely unpredictable. Rapid volleys were followed by interminable minutes of waiting. We just lay there with stomach no stomachs knotted and funny tasting mouths, running bloody movies of one kind or another. Several times one of us would mutter something about going out and ripping the guns out of their hands and keeping them all covered while the rest were disarmed, but each time the suggestion was made it was thought better of and we just cowered low. The waiting was the worst. Kaboom! Sometime around two in the morning, the last beer was drank and the last cartridge fired. They had run out of both. Leon and Roy retired to their tent. Being within 10 feet of them, we each had the full benefit 
of their anatomical descriptions of each co-ed, along with one or two improbable reasons as to why they hadn't brought them to bed. Around 3, or 3 a.m., we fell asleep, only reasonably confident that we would live to see another day. At 7 in the morning, the con our confidence was badly shaken as Leon and Roy made their departure. These boys must have been less than half human. A scant four hours ago, drunker than skunks, they had crawled under their tarp and passed out. Now they were up at Adam, of course still pissed drunk. With places to go and people to see, they packed up their gear in less than 15 minutes, hopped into the VW bug and tried to start the car. I sat up just in time to view the process through the drawstring screening of the tent's window. If I've neglected so far to mention the 10 to 15 degree slope that interposed the scant distance between our tent and the VW, it was because until that moment it seemed of little significance. As the VW failed to start rolling three feet at us in the venture, it became apparent that the bug had no emergency brake, or worse, who I was just too drunk to notice. There we were, ground zero in the flight path of the VW. Another turn of the key and the car rolled towards us with its starter whining like the banshee. Another four feet in the accelerating roll and Roy hit the brakes and held the car fast. Taking courage in the fact that Leon Roy were out of ammunition, one of our party yelled at the tent at them. No sweat, buddy, Leon yelled back. Roy will get the son of a bitch next try. Well, Leon was right. Roy did it in the next try. He might have even had a couple of feet to spare as the engine roared to life. Demonstrating consummate and clearly instinctive driving skill, he jammed on the brakes instantly, slammed it into reverse, and surged the car back up the incline, blasting the tent with sand and gravel. The VW disappeared behind a cloud of noxious blue smoke, along with Leon and Roy, who was out of our lives. I remember nothing at all of the rest of the trip, but I suppose that we beat it out of there post haste that morning. You know, I can't think of another place in Vermont from which I've taken a 10 inch brookie and not paid a return visit. Duck Pond will always be the exception. Well, the design on this was not to have you help you find the river by way of a map because you got those in your pocket or on the dashboard of your car, but to show you the river network and the rivers that we selected here to include are rivers that meet certain criteria. It's the, the main stem or major tribs, but beyond that, it's waters that are technically called B1 waters. It sounds like a weird thing, but it is a technical classification. They, in different basins, it's also aggravating that diff, different basins call them different things. It's quality water here, good fishing water there, water that is uh, considered to be B1 or maybe approved to be one or B1. There's, it's all the same, it's good fishing waters. This is what <clears throat> B1 waters, waters with abundant, wild sustaining salmonid populations supporting multiple age classes identified as very good or class B1 waters for recreational fishing. These waters support multiple age classes of trout totaling a, a minimum of 1,000 trout per mile, 200 trout per mile over six inches long. So this is the criteria that if you find a stream in here, other than I say the main stem and some of the main branches that we're gonna put those in obviously, but this is why the streams were selected that go in because it's all good quality water. Well, let me just show you what like good quality water would look like. This is the black, uh, the black branch in, uh, of the Nulhegan River. And you can see that, you know, it's got a nice bottom, there's rocks, there's forest up to the edge that produces shade at certain times of the year, insects are falling in, there's all kinds of good stuff going along the banks. And let me show you a river that's not so hot. And this is the Ottaquichi. And you can see why this is not such a great place because it's, it's effectively, it's a, it's a desert for trout there. There's either side is like, there's, there's no riparian buffer. There's only a little bit of, uh, of cover there at the, at the top. And basically for insect life, temperature is going to go up there. It's not a good trout river. So that is kind of the quality that we talked about in the book. And let me just ask if you see the, the these little red paint on top of these uh, 
right there. Does anybody know the significance of that? Anybody go out west fishing? You see a lot of that out west, and that is basically private property, no trespassing. That's what that means. And I think we might be looking over Ted Turner's uh, Buffalo Ranch here. This is the Ruby River in the background. The Ruby, you can drive along for it for 30 miles nearby. The Big Hole is nearby, and you can drive 40 or 50 miles of that river without finding a place where you can get in and fish. Now, fishing's great in Montana, don't get me wrong, but sometimes access is, is very weird and very hard. We in Vermont are so fortunate to have the great access because basically, if it's not posted, you can just fish it. Uh, you get your four wheels off the highway, or if you can get down into a stream, you can even go through private property. This is built into our Vermont Constitution. The colonists that were, uh, were here had just were fresh off of being in England with the class society and the lords and the ladies having all kinds of great hunting places to hunt and fish and so on. It was all private property. You can't, you can't fish it. So actually built into the Vermont Constitution is the right for you to fish on waters that are otherwise not posted or if they're navigable, and believe me, that can be some pretty small streams, you can be in that stream bed and go up and down the stream bed and it's, it's perfectly legal. One of the other aspects that's included in this book is access. <clears throat> and I, I put this up, I don't know if many of you don't know my history, but I, I've had a long standing interest in access for those who are physically challenged and so on, and part of this, uh, of this, this we decided to include in this was in the state, if there are access points that a wheelchair user can go and fish, they're in there. And in fact, I'm sorry to report, there's only three of those in Vermont. I mean, we do better on the lakes and ponds. We got a dozen or so. There should be scores more, but it's, it's very challenging and expensive to make things like this. Now, this is a wonderful place at the, uh, at the juncture of the Pesumsic River and the Moose River. You couldn't pick a better hole to have that. And if that's not crowded by a, a wheelchair user or somebody else that is physically challenged, well, anybody can go up there and fish as well. I'm gonna mention a, a resource that you might, if you're computer savvy and have got some patience, uh, the Vermont uh, Agency of Natural Resources has this Cool, really cool program. And if you look up Atlas, A-N-R, Atlas Light, L-I-T-E. Uh, and why they have a regular Atlas, why I'm saying light is the, the light is clunky enough. The uh, loading and having the data from the full blown version is gonna slow most computers down. So at any rate, there's all kinds of different features you can do in this. And what I used it for was to, uh, identify the, uh, the access points. And right along in here, this is, the, uh, this is the Barton River. We're about 200 feet from, uh, from Crystal Lake. It's outlet at Crystal Lake. And just about immediately, there's a, you can't see it too well, but there's a little green strip here highlighted on the map that is publicly owned. And so it's an interesting fact that back in the 60s, somehow that the fish and wildlife came up with a pot of money and were able to purchase access to a bunch of different stream beds and uh, stream side. Most of it, uh, there's some down around the Batten Kill, a lot occurred down there, but most of it occurred in the Northeast Kingdom, probably because of the poverty. Farmers didn't have money, so when they were offered some money for access, they took it. So the result is that when you look at the, the Black, and I'm not the Black River in the north, not the one down in Cavendish, but the Black, uh, the Clyde, the Barton, including the Willoughby, there is 60 miles of streamside public access on those. And all that public access, Bob and I have described in the book. So uh, I will mention one thing. I, I, it's a meets and bounds description, kind of like, oh, it's 100 feet from the bridge, or it's this, you tell here. And I did not put down in there, we talked about it, but did not put down the basically the GPS coordinates because <laughs> I didn't want to get in trouble. Because some of this access, nearly all of the access I would say that you'd see there like that qualifies as this, has never been public before. So you're not gonna find signage, 
something. But I didn't want somebody waving our book and a GPM some, at some farmer and says, I have a right to be here because some of the farmers might not even know that they, you know, three owners before back in the 60s that they yielded rights to uh, the access of the river. By those, by the way, at least you know, the minimum length uh, that is uh, 16 and a half feet, one rod, not a fly rod, although a 16 and a half footer might have some use there, huh? But anyhow, a 16 and a half foot swath. Show another uh, slide here. Now, is any of that recorded in town records? No, the only place I really could find it was on the maps, the ANR Atlas Light. Oh, okay. And I was able to identify those those areas by using that resource. Can uh, I jump in for a second? Yeah. On, <clears throat> as far as the regulation states, um, Vermont waters are accessible to within that British rod length of the high water mark of the river. Uh -huh. So when the state, I, I served on the Fish and Wildlife Board, and when the state had acquired a bunch of this land back then, it was in combination with the intent to allow access but not with the intent of walk through my yard. Okay. So a lot of it's not, to Peter's point, it's not published, but if you stay within the meets and bounds of that British rod length of the high water mark and you gain access to the river, okay. you are within the legal fishing access of the river. And then... Stay in either in the river or below the high water mark. Correct, and then at least you know you're you're legal. Because I did have an encounter to Peter's point with a landowner who had transferred title, <clears throat> and rather than get into an open dialogue, I said, "Look, and I'm going to have the game warden come by and explain it to you." And she was fine after that, but she right. her comment was, "Excuse me, would you get off my yard?" Uh -huh. And I said, well, I can't because the bank is too steep to go into the water here. So I'm just going to stay in the right of way and I'll, I'll get back in the river when I get below the property. Yeah. And she's like, well, you're on my land. And I said, actually, I'm not. <laughs> but I don't want to get into it right, right now. I'll let somebody else tell you. So we would recommend, I think, if you encounter something like that, you're going to find some detailed directions in this. I and mean, if you encounter a situation, I would say, you know, Bob had a great idea. Let the let a game warden sort sort, sort, uh, sort it out for you, but you'll you'll find it, you will be in the right with it because this is public, lots of public land. This, well, let me just show. This is a, another type where they have other you know larger tracks that they have purchased different places. This happens to be this is also on the Barton, but it gives you an idea that some of these have an extent. So that's like a piece of public land that that they've acquired that is just it's, it's not that narrow one rod width. And sometimes there's directions because sometimes it will hop from one side to the river on an, or another. You'll be, oh, okay, at a certain point, oh, public access is gone on this side. It picks up on the other side. It's very interesting. But there's some detailed, picture, uh, detailed descriptions of that in the book. Uh, stocking. Not a lot of Vermont streams are stocked. If I were, we do the calculation of, I think on, on, in our book here, there's a, we got 150, just about 150 trout streams are covered. I think Northern Cartographics, no, excuse me, 450 are covered in, in this book. Uh, Northern Cartographics, I think, did 16, 1,500 streams uh, back in 85. But a lot of them are not really relevant. Like, like here's a place I'm going to fish. It just, they exist, but not, we've selected that. Uh, but of those, say, if we use that 1,500 as like a baseline figure, say there's at least 1,500 trout streams in Vermont, there are more, less than one half of 1% receive any stocking. So it's very limited uh, stocking when you look at the big picture. And the other good news to talk about stocking is as of this year, brook trout that are stocked are going to be triploid brook trout. That is to say, they've got an extra chromosome and they can never reproduce. So from here on going forward, all the native strains of brook trout will be preserved. There'll be no interbreeding between anything that is stocked. Now, browns and rainbows are a different thing, but those aren't native fish here. But the native fish, uh, it's a great thing they'll have those, those 
strains will remain pure. So for stocking information on every, anything that has been stocked, we reviewed uh, at least six years of records at a minimum and then characterized what this general stocking was over six years. And there's a lot of numbers involved, so we did some rounding. You know, <clears throat> the fact that 150, oh, 1,015 fish were put in this place, to say, hey, close enough to say 1,000. I'm gonna drive you, we'll drive you nuts enough with the numbers in there without like nitpicking. Or if a, they measured trout to the 10th of an inch. Well, we were rounding those off to half inch and quarter inches or something like that, it's just a little more to make it easier reading. But in general, there's a, if any uh, stream had been stocked, there's a characterization in there that talks about the stocking pattern for the least, at least the last six years. And uh, on the stocking, there are also there's special programs that there are eight rivers in the state that receive special stockings of two-year fish. And these are highlighted in the book as well. Uh, these are these are put in rivers where they're not going to likely be able to hold over for another year, although there's a couple of rivers that actually do have some holdovers. But uh, they're places that, are, that really can't, aren't geared to support trout all by themselves. And they're also geographically spread around the state, so uh, the only place that's really missing any of that is the Northeast Kingdom because why screw around with something that's that good? <laughs> so. But anyhow, here's some, some of the rivers are, uh, this is uh, the freight train hole on the Black River in Cavendish. Beautiful river, by the way. The trophy rivers, as they call them, are meadow cut. And so there's a certain character to that that's different. But this is not a meadow cut river. This is like, this is freestone. It's got nice runs and rocks. It's loaded with, it's just like a classic trout stream. So if you get an opportunity to go down to Cavendish, there's all kinds of parking too along the ways. You drive a, you can't drive, you know, a quarter mile without seeing a good place to pull off and park. This is East Creek in Rutland. One of the more interesting rivers in that. This is the start. It just be up above. There's like a, a, a little dam. There's an outflow from it. So this is the first part. You go to the other side of the bridge that I'm kind of standing on there. It goes through a golf course for a while, then leaves. From the golf course, it goes into a, like a suburban area characterized by ranch houses, and then goes into another area that's industrial with warehouses, and then finally emp empties into the Castleton River. But they have wonderful brown trout in there, and actually there's one, there's places where they're, they're catching trout that are holding over that exceed well over 20 inches, so it's a neat place to fish. So, so that goes into the Custom River or the Otter Creek? Uh, excuse me, Otter Creek, you're correct, thank you. Yeah. Uh, oh, this is uh, the Missisquoi. That would be the upper part, that's the start of the Trophy River. It goes down a couple of miles from there. These are just to give you some illustration. This is Fairfax, a trophy section, and uh, I have fished this for years, but I don't like fishing this area because it's very crowded. If you go down the road a mile or so, or half a mile down the road, You'll find nice stretches of river where you might see somebody fishing off a few hundred yards or but you can get a nice stretch of river to yourself. This is just up the road here. This is the Winooski River here in Waterbury. I was t telling another presentation here, I, for the first time this, this, uh, this summer, I learned how to fish water like this. Another guide on the Connecticut River that I went with, basically he was talking about fishing this kind of water. And it is just, the trick is to fish it really slow. And he had just like, he was using these little number 12 nymphs. And he gave, he gave his flies at the beginning of the day, each one, don't lose them. <laughs> he had just tied them up this morning, in the morning for us, and that's all he had. And they were working. But the trick was, was just like the slow hand twist retrieve, just bringing, bringing the, uh, the nymph in very slow. And just, he doesn't use indicators or anything like that, but he just like would watch the line. And so we had some quite a bit of success like that. So I'm not so intimidated by water like that when I see it anymore. So now we'll talk about the tips and tactics. I'm gonna sit for a minute. So on the tips and tactics, we um, got together with some local guides that helped to share some of their information. So for each region or major watershed, 
somebody from that area said, geez, you know, I fish down here a lot, and we recruited them. So if you read through the book, how many of you guys have it yet? Three, four? Um, so as you go through the chapters, there's going to be the local angle. And those people are going to provide you with the information. They fish on that water. These are the fly patterns. These are the secret places, you know, that we like to access the river. There's no spot burning involved here, though. So there's no spray paint on a rock. Stand here, cast there, catch a fish, go home. So you still have to put in the effort. What I tried to do, um, after having <clears throat> owned the fly rod shop for the last 20 years, and prior to that having a guide service, so this is my 38th year, is to take some of the stuff that I've learned over the last 38 years that I have to do to try to get people on to fish. And in order to do that, um, especially in Vermont trout waters, I've been very fortunate to guide in different areas. So I run trips, trips or hosted trips to Labrador, British Columbia, Alberta. Um, I used to live in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, down in the Caribbean islands, um, which is looking pretty nice after today's weather. Um, all right, work with me a little bit here, guys. Oh, okay. But the snow's coming, so the Caribbean's looking a lot nicer. So um, what I did is I said, okay, we're going to take the four seasons for fishing because Vermont has open year-round trout water, <clears throat> and I want to try to give people information on how to catch flies during the four seasons. Because during the, basically the, the gravy-grabbing months of the year when most anglers go out, which is June, July, and August, and that's when fish are actively feeding, they're more likely to chase food, they're super aggressive. I don't want to say everybody can catch a fish then, but that's the time of year that people go out, put the effort in, and they're typically very successful. When it comes to spring, summer, winter, fall, the challenge becomes how do I catch fish during these less active feeding cycles? <clears throat> so what happened is I said, let me take some of the stuff that I've learned from all the different places where I've either guided or fished and take those tips and tactics and apply them to, to the fishing experience in Vermont. So what we did is we wrote chapters on fishermen spring, summer, winter, and fall. So if you're going to approach fishing in Vermont trout waters during those months, these are the methods that you want to use. These are the fly patterns that are tested, proven, successful. In Fisherman's Spring, um, the slides are going to be a little bit tough, so I'll just summarize them and then you're just going to have to read the book. But what you're dealing with in Fisherman's Spring is the water temperature ranges of typically less than 50 degrees. Water column is to fish successfully try to cover the middle and bottom water columns, which for fly fishermen I will tell you, in spite of your level of experience, most people don't know how to do that or don't do it well enough to consistently catch fish. And then lastly, the time of day. I get people every spring that come in the shop and they're in their waders and boots. The store opens at 9 o'clock and they're like, well, I was out this morning at the crack of dawn and I didn't have any luck catching anything. And I said, well, I'm going to leave at 11. And I'm going to fish till about 3, because as the water temperature heats up, the fish will be more active. So you're going home, and I'm just starting. So a lot of people don't understand the relationship between water temperature and how fish feed or the food reacts. So I te I've been teaching a course at Johnson State College for over 30 years, fly fishing. If you need a half credit to graduate, see me after this presentation. <laughs> The fly fishing class, we seine the river, collect the bugs, put them in a tray. In the spring of one of those classes about a decade ago, we collected a, a huge cluster of Hendrickson nymphs. We put them in the tray. <clears throat> it was a sunny day. The water temperature was about 46 degrees. And as I was doing my class, the water temperature heated up in the tray and the bugs hatched. So we created the artificial 
temperature range for those bugs to hatch and the kids got to see it. So the temperature is so critical to not just the fish feeding cycles or the fish movement cycle, but the food corresponds. So now let's go to the next slide. In the spring, we've got your terminal tackle. So we cover in the book, <clears throat> this is really critical because if you're set up right, you're set up for success. If you're set up wrong, it won't work. So leader construction is probably one of the things that most people are intimidated by, but it's truly the answer to succeeding. So we cover rod lengths, leader, tippet, um, fly patterns that are recommended, and all of these are in the, in the chapter. The only reason I don't want to dwell on this is I'll send you these slides if you email me which the last presentation Peter and I did, I actually got three or four people and we sent them off. But it's in the book. What I brought that I want to show you are the rods set up to do it this way. And show and tell is better than trying to read it or envision it, you know, from the book. Next slide, Peter. This is an example of the floating line with a, with a nymphing system attached. <clears throat> Again, the leader formula is on the slide. I'll send it to you. The leader formula is not in the book. It just talks about using a strike indicator leader system. So as a special bonus here tonight, I'm sending you the slide so that you can have that formula. Um, next, I'm going to show it to you in a minute. Next slide, Peter. This is a floating line with a sink tip. So both of these systems, the indicator system for nymphing and the sink tip system, are the two systems that'll get you into the middle and bottom water column. Okay, that's your spring setup. Next slide. Fisherman summer. Water temperature, typical range, 60 to 70 degrees. Water column to fish is typically top and middle. Everyone's a hero that time of year. Typically, you don't need a sinking tip leader or nymphing rig. But by having that in the back of your head, if all else fails, you can go to those systems and still catch a trout. And I'll explain to you one of my days on the river where that, that saved the day. Fishing time <coughs> completely switches now. So now the guides at the fly rod shop are meeting you guys at 5.30 in the morning and we're back to the shop by 10 a.m. The cooling off effect of the water from the previous day or the uh, low sunlight level at the end of the day will vary the water temperature one or two degrees and be enough to trigger a feeding cycle for fish. At night, Fortunately for us in Vermont, the temperatures cool off. This was one of the best summers I've seen in, in decades, literally, for fishing consistently throughout the summer. And one of the best things that happened is we had the cooling nights. Plus, Vermont has a lot of the rivers that Peter and I covered that have cold discharge tributaries that help to cool that water during the evening. So if you do your exploring, you take a stream thermometer, or if you're wearing a pair of shorts and wet wading as you walk up and down the river, you'll feel those cold pockets, and that's where you want to focus your fishing attention, provided the, the habitat's there to hold fish. <clears throat> but at this time of year, your leader tip of construction is typically going to be on a floating line. You don't need a sink tip leader. You don't need strike indicators unless you're nymphing and uh, you want to, to have a little bit more success on not missing the strikes. Fly color patterns in the spring. So <clears throat> you come in the fly rod shop, you buy a box full of flies, you've got hundreds. You've, you haven't organized them yet. You haven't spent a lot of time in the winter kind of sorting through them and spending those nights kind of getting ready. So the flies are all mixed up. So in the summer, when the cooling effect triggers the hatch, what color flies should you use? White, 
tan cream. So the cooling effect of the water in the summertime triggers the light shaded patterns to hatch. So the names of the flies will help you figure that out. Light Cahill, cream variant, pale morning done. Pale fly, morning hatch, done is a dry fly. Pale evening done. Wow, it must come off at night. So the flies, a lot of the flies are actually going to give you the tip of when to fish them or what the colors are by name and when to use them. In the springtime, when the water temperatures average below 50 degrees, the darker colored nymphs hatch in the spring and fall. So the shades of the flies are typically dark, the Hendrickson nymph, the gray wolf, the black caddis. So if you literally take your fly boxes after tonight, because you're going to run home after this presentation and probably be up all night organizing your fly box, you can set them up by spring, summer, and fall shades. And now your flies are all organized as the seasons change. You know when to grab what fly. Fisherman's fall. We're in it. <clears throat> you want to fish top, middle, and bottom water column. Best time to fish again is midday. Water temperature average is between 40 and 60 degrees. So just in the last couple of days, the water temperature has dropped below the 60 degree mark. And now it's down into that hovering 50 degree range. <clears throat> we've had beautiful sunny days, so the water temperature heats up during the day. So we've been catching fish on blue-winged olives during the middle of the day that have hatched. So our dry fly fishing on grasshoppers, ants, beetles, blue-winged olives, isonychia, all those flies are catching fish literally from about 11 to 3 in the afternoon. We had a full day trip two days ago. We started the trip in the morning with a sink tip leader, fishing streamer flies, caught a couple of fish. As the day progressed, we switched to dry flies. And then the last hour of the trip, we went back to nymphing with an indicator system and caught a fish on a nymph. And that, that person, in a full day of guiding, experienced all three water columns of how to fish because the time of the year they were here warranted that we cover those techniques. So that was an awesome day on the water for not only the guide, but for the customer. Okay, so that's your formulas. Recommended streamer flies, nymphing flies, terrestrials. Typically you're using lighter leaders in the summertime. So are you guys familiar with the X number system on a leader? As the X number goes up, the leader gets smaller in size. When the water's low, clear in the summer months fish are obviously pressured more you're typically fishing much lighter setups so 5x 6x even 7x leader next slide fisherman's winter the most enjoyable time of the year to fly fish in vermont the winooski river all the rivers we covered in the book talk about the uh, sections of Vermont rivers that are open for year-round angling. <clears throat> so for those of you out there that have to buy your license on January 1st and experience the new year with the fishing experience on Vermont's trout streams, um, it's the most challenging technical fishing time. Weather, you can't fall in. If you do, you have to go home. The one thing I want to give you a tip on that's outside the uh, fishing methods is now that Vermont regulations allow for felt sole boots to be worn in Vermont again, don't wear them in the winter. If you haven't done it, go for it. <clears throat> Just because you want to experience it. So you step in the water, the felt gets wet. You step out of the water, the felt begins to freeze. And as you walk to your car, you will grow a foot and a half in height because the snow on the bottom of the boots will collect and continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger as you walk to your car. And by the time you get back to your vehicle, you'll have to take the boots off to drive home because you won't be able to push on the gas pedal. You won't get it off either. I mean, it will freeze solid. So the fisherman's winter, you're only going to be fishing in the lowest water column. I had steelhead guided from 
I leave Monday. I come back Thanksgiving. I used to stay there through many of the min winter months into the spring. I grew up just outside of uh, Rome, New York, and guide on the Salmon River in Pulaski. And that winter steelhead fishing is unbelievable. But the water temperatures are 34 degrees on a hot day, 33 degrees on a cold day. And the fish will bite, but you have to get the fly to the bottom. So I guided there and then took those techniques when Vermont opened its year-round waters and applied them to my winter fishing here in Vermont. And that's how you catch fish. And I'll go through it here in a minute. This is your leader construction. It's in the book again. Okay, so the last slide is the day that Peter and I went out on the river to take all this stuff that we had done over a year plus, 14 months, year and a half. Year and a half. And uh, we said, well, let's go out and do a little bit of research. So we met at my shop. Uh, Parker came with us. We went down to a secret location in Stowe, and I spent the morning netting Peter's fish for him. It was awesome. Um, so that was the best, I don't want to say the best part, but that was one of the more enjoyable parts of putting this book together was having to put the research into it at the end. So there's the last slide. So at this point, what I'd like to do, if I can <clears throat> take another 10 minutes of your time, I want to show you how to set these leader systems up. So can you guys flick the lights back up? Okay, so <clears throat> after 30 years of guiding, instead of having a vest, I finally went to a fanny pack. Some guys like the sling packs, chest packs. But if I had to go out and fish winter, spring, summer, fall, right now, everything I need to cover all three, four seasons of fishing is right here. So this is a leader wallet. It has my floating leaders in it. So those would be my standard trout leaders, seven and a half feet, nine feet. It has um, all of my sink tip leaders. Okay, so what I do is I take this line that's called uh, T14, T10, T8, and that stands for tungsten weight. So it's a leader that has a tungsten core. And depending on the tungsten weight, that tells you what the sink rate of the line is. So T14 is heavier than T8. So as you go up the tungsten chart, I cut those in 3 foot, 5 foot, and 7 and a half foot lengths. And they're covered in the book. I put a perfection loop at both ends of those. So when I take my floating fly line that now comes manufactured with a loop connector on the end, I can take my sink tip leader, pass it through the loop of my floating line, and back out the other end. Does that make sense? OK. Then attached to that, this is the mistake that most fishermen make is they buy a seven and a half foot 3x liter, 3x being fairly heavy, maybe eight pound test, <clears throat> and they attach a woolly bugger to it. And what happens is that as the tungsten weight is falling into the water column, the monofilament does what? It floats. So the tungsten weight is going here, and the sink tip to the fly is riding high. So now, at the end of the rip, at drift, the, the leader system pulls tight in the current, and the fly snaps down to the proper depth, and it's too late. You might grab one, because the fish gods are always with us. They always bite once in a while because that's why we go back. 
but I want to catch them all. So I take that T14 head and I attach about an 18 inch to 24 inch piece of straight monofilament called a tippet and I pick a straight piece of mono between 6 and 10 pound test and I cut it at that two to three, one and a half to two foot, three foot maximum length. So now that whole thing is sinking together. So consistently the fly travels with the sinking tip leader system, which does two things. It allows me to control the depth of the fly <clears throat> because I can gauge the sink tip leader sink rate and how the current is pulling it through the water and I can adjust it to mend it and create a deeper run, a deeper drift. So I'm taking you guys on the trip I did the other day for the full day. So on that sink tip leader system, I said to the client, <clears throat> the first thing he did is he stood facing upriver and he casted the sink tip leader system upstream. And what happened? It fell to the bottom of the riverbed and he broke off the fly because he couldn't control the speed of the drift and the this tungsten head just sank to the bottom. So then I repositioned him and had him cast it down and across river and now the current grabs the line as it hits the water and as the fly's drifting it's sinking and he took the rod tip and he put a few twitches on it so he made the fly look like a darting minnow. And I said, well, that's getting down there, but it's not deep enough. On the next cast, I want you to cast it down and across and then flip the line upstream. And that's called a flip mend because we're very technical. So we used the flip mend, took the pressure off the leader, and the fly started to immediately sink deeper in the water column. And as it went across the current, he started twitching it, and he caught a fish. So the difference between those two drifts wasn't the fly. It was the depth the fly traveled. Okay? So on another drift, take the line, cast it across stream, and as it's drifting down, mend it downstream. And what does that do? It grabs the fly line, and it makes it accelerate in speed, and now the fly travels at a faster speed. So why do fish bite? They bite by sight, by smell, and vibration and movement. So when we're fly fishing, we're not letting them smell it, so we've eliminated that sense. So it better look good, and it better move right because the vibration and movement is what triggers the, the fish to react. So we're making it hard on ourselves, right? Because we want to fly fish, we want to make it hard. But if you learn how to control the speed of the fly, the depth of the fly, and know how to pick the right colors, all of a sudden we start catching way more fish. So on that sink tip leader system, this rod has a woolly bugger on it because everybody in here hopefully knows a woolly bugger fly because we got 30 of those in our box. <clears throat> and then attached to it is our sink tip leader, which is a different color, and then our short section of monofilament. Okay? And then I'm going to pass this around so you guys can look at that while I'm showing you the next setup. So, Peter, if you click the up arrow until we get to the indicator leader, and it's the one that had all the little this? next one. This one? Yep. All right, do you guys ever use strike indicators? Anybody? Yeah? All right, so a strike indicator. There's one, okay. <clears throat> if you're going to be fishing the bottom water uh, column, uh, technical difficulty. That's fine. Did I, something, I don't know what I did. <laughs> that's all right. I'll keep going. <laughs> so this is this is a strike indicator. <clears throat> it sounds cool. 
What is it? Bobber. It's a bobber. <laughs> so the bobber tells you what? That the fish ate the fly. It goes dunk, dunk. It moves, it twitches. You lift the rod tip up, you set the hook. According to field testing data, I don't know who did it, but I've seen it published a lot, 75% of the strikes that you have on a leader system that does not have an indicator is a missed bite. Upwards of 75% of the takes you don't feel and you miss. So if you're trying to nymphish deeper water levels without a bite indicator, you're missing takes. I do it all the time because I don't care if I catch the fish, I just like the challenge. But it requires you to be super attentive to your leader drift so that when that thing moves or twitches, you can react and set the hook. So at least for a while, to prove the science, try these, a bite indicator, okay? So the way they work, they make them in different types. This one's got a little gasket on it, and you make a loop through your leader wrap it around the gasket, slide it up or down to adjust it. This one has a little plastic cap on it and a slot. Now, do these ever spook the fish? I, I don't know. I don't think so. I'm not catching less fish, I think, because of it. I will tell you, I've had fish eat that. Oh, okay. So I missed that one. Yeah. Well, I caught a brown trout once with a cigarette filter. So nice. Was it smoking camels that day or <laughs> Paul Malls? No, I think it was uh, Marlboro. <laughs> it was a Marlboro, all right. Yeah. Yeah. So they are smokers, um, <laughs> but, you know, <clears throat> some of them aren't, which is good. So the strike indicator is just what it says. Where do you put a strike indicator on your leader when you're nymph fishing? The, the science formula is to put it at one and a half times the depth you think you're fishing. So if you're in a three foot run, carrying the drift through a run that's about three feet deep, you slide the indicator up to about four and a half feet so that when it floats towards the bottom, it can move through the current and that leader can kind of travel with the water and get you closer to the lower later. Here's the problem. If you're not carrying enough weight, when you cast it, the fly hits here, it starts to travel down, it gets to the bottom, you're mending your line to control your drift, it travels a couple of feet, and then it swings back up. Now for many, many summer fishermen, they'll come in the shop and they'll say, Man, I do a lot of nymph fishing, but I catch a ton of fish when it swings. Why? Because the fish sees it moving. So that's not the way. If you're going to be fishing that method, take the bobber off and fish a tight line swing through the water. Give the fish the movement it wants. The fish are more aggressive in the summer. You don't have to necessarily go to the bottom to catch them. And one of my preferred methods of fishing in Vermont in, in the summer is to fish a soft hackle fly, meaning an emerging insect, that looks like it's traveling up through the water column on a tight line drift so the fish sees it. And here's why. When they grab it, they set the hook. It's deadly. My hook to land ratio goes way up. If I hook eight fish, I land six because it's a tight line hit. On a tight, on a slack line dead drift, the fish grabs it, spits it out, I react and I'm like, oh, I just missed that guy. So you miss more fish that way. So a lot of people say, well, I'm catching them on the swing. Okay. In the summer, you can get away with that. In the fall, you can get away with it. In the spring. But once you get into the winter months, the fish's metabolism is much slower, and the fish won't chase the food. <clears throat> so now you have to dead drift. So here's your goal. I want to cast the fly here. 
Hopefully it goes to the bottom crease. This is my bottom layer. Isn't that nice the way that sheet did that? So here's my middle water column and here's my upper water column. The fish are here. The food falls into this bottom layer and then it travels as far as it can in that lower water column. And then at the end of the drift, you can't manage it anymore and it swings out. But instead of having this distance of opportunity, I've now increased it to this distance of opportunity. How do you do that? You have to use a super heavy weighted leader system. So the float that you use has to be something that will carry the weight. So it's not a strike indicator now, it's literally a bobber. So the bobber in this case, is shaped like a teardrop. The black marking tells you that the, the float is traveling at the proper depth. The white mark is the water mark. So when you slack the line pressure, the float should pop upright, <clears throat> and it should float right at the white mark. If you see a lot of black, you haven't added enough weight yet. The orange is so that we can see it. So it goes back to this, this float color, the bite indicator. A lot of people like orange because it shows up in the water. Now, these come in four different sizes. They make them in football floats, teardrop floats. This one happens to be called a raven float. So they're all different shapes and they're meant to carry weight. So I did a trip with a guy, set him up with this, see how the, the weight is spread out through the leader. And the reason we use a chain of weight instead of an individual split shot is because the chain of weight, when you mend the line, the chain falls in a straight line. A chain of weight falls super fast. An individual split shot will travel. So this is a very abrupt boom the flies in the zone. <clears throat> now, as the bobber travels past me, I keep throwing what's called a stack mend. So I'm stacking the line upstream of the bobber so that every time I throw that little flip or stack out, it takes the pressure off the float and the float continues to travel at a natural dead drift. Attached to the end, is a piece of tippet about 18 inches. The last weight is here and the flies here. So if I go back to the water column theory, I gauge the float depth so the weight lands at this line and the fly travels in this column of water. That's where the fish are. So as it travels through there, the fish that sees that fly can just go grab it and move back to its spot. So it's still a very technical way of fishing, but at least I know on every drift I'm in the zone. Okay? So here's my job. I leave for New York tomorrow, uh, Monday. <clears throat> I'm going to guide for the next 30 days. The water temperatures are dropping. We're going to be using that indicator system to fish every day. No more dry flies. It's over. Maybe a sink tip leader. Let the fly swing deep. Catch a hot fish on that. Boom. He bites it. But I know if I go to this method, I'm in the game on every drift. I'm in the lower water column. So for the next month, every day I'm guiding, I'm getting paid to teach you how to mend it properly, but more importantly, I'm getting paid really well, hold the rod for me, right here. I'm getting paid really well to do this. Wow, that was great. <laughs> Bob, you're incredible. I never would have done that, I know. Wait a second, you didn't catch one, let's try it again. Oh, wow. All right, try it again. Boom, fish on. How come? We found them. Okay, now I adjusted too high. 
And as the float's traveling downriver, it keeps going tick, 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 tick. That means the last split shot on that chain is dragging. So now I go, wow, you're amazing. That'll be $390. Like Peter said when he learned how to fish with, um, with uh, Osprey, right? Yeah, Ken Hastings. Kenny Hastings. Getting back to the Winooski. Fish the fly super slow. The fish want to eat. But when you're looking at a super slow river, it's like fishing in a pond. How do you know where to fish? You don't, so you have to cover it all. So you create a grid pattern. Mathematically, you cut that grid pattern through the river, and you take a systematic casting approach. So not only do I move the bobber, but I go one step further, and I say, Byron, good job. Take a step down river. Wow, that's incredible. <laughs> Try it again. Five drifts later, Byron, you're doing great. Take another step down river. <laughs> Unbelievable. Because here's what everyone does. They anchor in. They cast here, they cast there, they cast there, and they go home and mow the grass. Okay? So here's what I do. I say, cast here, let out three feet of line. Cast again, let out three feet of line. Cast again. I can't cast it any further than that. I can't either. Don't worry about it. Take a step. Cast, drift. Take a step, cast, drift. Now, 10 minutes later, we're at the tail out of the run. Come on back up. Let me see the fly. Try that one. We go through 20 minutes later. We didn't catch any. Let's go to another spot. So here's the deal. <clears throat> I'm not catching fish all day. I'm not catching them on every drift, but I'm fishing a very systematic method of covering water. I go big fly, small fly, deep, middle, top, move, go to the next spot. So if I fish a run and I've spent an hour in it and I haven't caught anything, it's maybe not the day, but I covered it. So I've got the Dave Washburn carpenter's method of fly fishing. I just pull another tool out of my tool bag and I try something different. Okay, so I have not just a framing hammer, but I've got a skill saw, a table saw, a coping, a sawzall because I make mistakes. And all of a sudden, now I've taken four tools through the run, and I've covered it. And I didn't cover it maybe well enough, but I'll move to another spot, because I know if I go someplace else, I'll find a fish that bites. So I'm going to end this on a story that, I, that happened to me. <clears throat> so I went up to the upper Connecticut River, and I fished in above Canaan in Beecher Falls. I hiked out to an island, and I carried three rods. So I saw you guys writing notes. So the first thing to success is you have to buy three rods from the fly rod shop. <laughs> Being in the morning. Get, being in the morning, awesome, I gotta take it. So I've got three rods set up. One has a dry fly set up, one has a sink tip set up, and one has this indicator set up. I went to the upper Connecticut and instead of going the river and re-rigging everything, because that's a little complicated to make that setup, I carried them in. And I set two rods on the island. I fished down through the run with a caddis dry fly and a soft tackle emerger. Just exactly the way I told you to do it. Made a pass. It took me 25, 30 minutes. <whistles> Nothing. Went back, grabbed my sink tip system, went back through the run, Nothing. Grabbed the indicator, went down through the run, and caught over a dozen fish. 
didn't make it all the way. Went back, grabbed my dry fly rod and said, it, they've got to be biting. They turned on. Went back through, finished out the pass, zero. So now I'm going, wow, that's pretty interesting. Let me grab the same tip and try that. Nothing went back through with the indicator system and caught three more fish and said, okay, they're only feeding on the bottom. And that was in the month of September. So this system saved the day. Most fly fishermen on the first pass with the caddis dry fly and the soft tackle would have said, well, they're not biting today, I guess I'll go home. So don't give up, change tactics, okay? If you become very comfortable with tying knots, switching from one system to the other is not as painful as you think. And the biggest comment I get from people that I guide is that after the trip's over, they say the thing I learned the most is you're constantly changing your tactics. And at the end of the day, it, something worked. And they said, you know, you either, Here's what I do. I have a net that has a handle, and the net comes up to here, because then I go like this. And I lean on it, and I say, take a step, because it's a very active sport for me. <laughs> so I lean on it a little longer, and I say, take another step. So while they're not catching a fish after a while, I say, you know what? And I grab one of the other rods, and I change it. And I say, I walk over and say, here, try this go back through and fish it again. Lean on the net, go through the same thing, take a few steps, it doesn't work, switch it to something else. So I have confidence that you guys that don't fish a lot haven't had the opportunity, or I've been very fortunate to do this for my whole life, so I'm very confident. I don't get up in the morning and say, man, I hope I catch one today. I get up in the morning and I say, man, I hope I catch a bunch of them today. This is going to be great. If I go out there and, and I'm like, holy crap, I hope I catch one today, that's a bad day. So I'm going out there ready to get them. Now my job is, how, how am I going to figure out how to make them bite? And if you come up with a system with covering the water depth as your priority, and confidently saying, I want to fish this fly at a certain level. When I get a bite, I don't go, wow, how did that happen? I go, wow, the fish was three feet down. That's kind of cool. I wonder if there's another one there. So every drift has a purpose. And when you read this book and you learn about those seasons and those terminal tackle systems and then read the local angle from the guides, a lot of the stuff they put in there, not, we didn't coach them what to do. We said, you guys know what you do. We want you to cover some recommended fly patterns, time of year, and the methods you use to catch the fish. And when we got the stuff back from these guys, we were like, wow, this is going to be awesome. The, so the person that came in the book about two weeks ago, I mentioned this to Peter, said to me, I was looking at the book for inspiration. I, or for information, and I read the book and found inspiration. I'm going to a spot that I read about because the spot on the um, Pasumpsic River that the guide wrote the info on sounded great. I can't wait to go up there and try that spot. So that's, as far as I'm concerned, the book did its job. So it's going to sit on your coffee table, and hopefully all winter long you'll be inspired. All right, so thank you. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, leader formulas, we'll email them. And you guys know everything because you've already been to all my seminars. No, you yourself have said, you know, your students have to hear it three or four times. <laughs> and since I was a teacher all my life, I know that to be true. Okay. So, uh, Bob, when you were describing the uh, sinking leader setup, the sinking leader is coming off the fly line, and then you said there's a length of monofilament. Correct. It's How? just tippet. It's just tippet. It's just your tippet section. Oh, yeah. so the tippet really just comes right from the sinking leader. 
Well, uh, the leader has a loop connector. Yeah. So you can either fix the tippet to that loop by uh, using a fisherman's knot or a perfection loop. What I, here's what I do. I take this. It's on my bag. It's on my waist. Yeah. And I'm using a sink tip leader. So I grab the pound test I want, and I pull it to here. OK. That's, what's the length? In the book, we said 24 to 36 inches. When I'm on the river, it's that much. What, what is it? 22. So if I'm fishing with different leader setups, I go this, this, and it's that, those are my three measurements. What's the email address? Bob at flyrodshop.com. But to your point, you're fishing in muddy water with a woolly bugger. The fish is going to hit it hard. Go with eight pound. 3x tippet. Okay. Don't worry about tapered leaders, tapered lines. Okay. The fish isn't going to be leader shy. He's going to grab it. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, folks.